Hi, my name is Michael and welcome to my video on market failure and government intervention. So here we have a pretty typical supply and demand model. As we can see, the supply curve is sloped upward. So we see that it's sloped upward here. And we see the demand curve is, as we would expect, sloping downward. And we see, of course, where these two curves interact at Q star and P star is the equilibrium point. This is the point where both suppliers and demanders will demand and supply this quantity at this price. So we're all happy. Everything's efficient, right? Well, the problem is, is that when we get this model and we start relaxing its assumptions, we don't assume perfect competition. We don't assume perfect information. We start getting some deviations. Maybe we don't get an efficient outcome. Maybe we get a market failure and maybe government intervention is necessary. So what exactly is a market failure? Well, today we're just going to define a market failure as a situation in which markets fail to allocate the efficient quantity of a good or service, right? Of a good or service. So where basically this doesn't happen, where we don't get an efficient outcome, where markets are not meeting our needs appropriately. So we're going to be talking about three cases where this happens. We'll talk about public goods, things like military, police, national parks, where excludability and concepts like rivalry will come into play of how we could possibly uh, get these to work. So number two, we have externalities. So things like pollution and noise, sort of these things that are kind of products of a market interaction, where maybe a third party is affected by me trading with someone, like pollution and noise. And then last, we'll talk about market power and monopolies. How do monopolies maybe create market failures? How do they create inefficiency? And then, of course, we'll talk about, could we possibly fix these through government interventions? And, of course, maybe, do we even want to? Can government intervention be bad or even worse than a market failure? So, anyway, let's dive into public goods. So, right here, you can see, uh, let's say that you're giving a fireworks show in your favorite town, Town USA. And you give out a survey, and you find that 100 people are willing to pay five dollars, five dollars to see a fireworks show. You figure the cost of fireworks is about three hundred dollars. So you say, hey, I'll put on a fireworks show that'll give me a two hundred dollar nice little profit. So you make these little boxes, you put them around town, you put these five dollar donations. You do this fireworks show, everybody's happy, everybody's like, oh Michael, that was a great fireworks show, yeah, great, huh? But when you open up the donation boxes, the reality creeps up on you. 100 people did go to this fireworks show, but uh-oh, you only got $200 in donations. You lost $100. So, of course, your question here is, well, what the heck happened, right? Why exactly did people say they were willing to pay $5 to see a fireworks show, but they only donated $200? Well, my friend, you have run into something known as the free rider problem. And this has to do with non-excludability, non non so quite the mouthful there, and non-rivalrousness of goods. So things like police, military, parks, and fireworks, I can't disinclude you. They're non-excludable because, for instance, fireworks are way too high in the sky. I can't really prevent you from seeing it. And they're non-rivalrous, meaning that me consuming fireworks, so watching the fireworks show from one side of town, isn't taking away from you watching it, right? So when we're in the situation where a good has both of those qualities, we get what is known as a public good and we run into the free rider problem, right? We run into the free rider problem. So how do we solve this? Well, we give a government solution is typically to tax and provide these goods, right? And that's typically what happens with the police, military, parks, and fireworks. Government just takes up $5 from everyone, spreads, buys the fireworks, and of course, everybody's happy. We get the fireworks show that people want the people producing the fireworks show get to cover their cost. Next, let's talk about excludability, or sorry, externalities. Wow, there's a lot of X's in here. So let's talk about shoes. So let's say these blue lines, you know the green line for a second, the blue lines are the market for shoes. Now, of course, supply and demand curve. But here's the problem. This supply curve is only counting the cost of the shoemakers, so things like the labor, the cost of the machines, the cost of the rent of the building, right? It's not including all this stuff over here, which is the 
pollution that he's imposing on this town, right? You see all these these poor people. This guy, poor guy over here is coughing. So Shoemaker's not taking into account the cost of pollution of the town, right? So that's not included as a supply curve. So unfortunately, the costs are not high enough. So we get too many shoes and there is too much pollution in this case at Q1. So what do we do? Well, we have some solutions. First one is, of course, government can just pass laws and say, hey, you guys got to follow these rules. You can only make Q star. And maybe they hire inspectors. You know, they hire uh, inspectors to go and check on this. The problem with this solution is that it's pretty costly, right? You got high enforcement costs. You got to make the inspectors are doing the job. You got to pay them enough so they're not susceptible to corruption, right? You got to make sure that that is working. But, of course, that's very costly. So economists tend to approve of these other two solutions are known as market-based solutions. And the reason they're known as market-based solutions is because these solutions allow the market to kind of finish itself, right? To kind of fix itself. So the first one we have is taxes, right? So what happens here is that the government simply taxes and brings up the supply curve to the efficient quantity at Q star and P star. And essentially you're internalizing the cost to producer, right? You're internalizing the cost of this pollution to the producer. And then of course, number three, we have what are known as pollution credits. And all that basically means is that the government is gonna cap the amount that you can make at Q-Star, and then they just let companies kind of trade to get however many pollution credits they want. For instance, maybe some type of shoe requires more pollution than another, so that factory want to buy more pollution credits than the other, we get a more efficient outcome. All right, so the last place we might see a market failure is with market power. Now, of course, with a monopoly, we know we have one seller, and so what happens is that the monopolist, you can go look at a video for this model, but basically all you have to know is that the monopolist keeps quantity artificially low to gain profit, right? He keeps this low. He doesn't produce as much quantity as he should be where the demand curve equals the marginal cost curve so that he can get profit, right? He can kind of charge other customers a little more. So this is an inefficient outcome because we have some customers willing to pay for this good that aren't unfortunately getting the good because of the monopolist, what the incentives to the monopolists. So typically we see these in natural monopolies, things like utilities, water and electricity. And the government solution here most of the time is to kind of just take control over those industries to kind of provide it and hopefully provide the good at Q star. All right, so last but not least, let's dive into, we've talked about how government control is good, right? How it can kind of fix these problems. But let's explore why maybe government intervention is not such a good thing. Maybe we don't want so much government intervention. Well, the first problem, of course, is that markets still allocate goods. They still work pretty well. As long as you don't, as long as you're able to have private goods, if, as long as they're excludable and rivalrous, and you, uh, there's very few externalities and it's coming from a competitive market, markets are still going to work pretty well. And that's generally the situation we face most of the time. The second thing is information, right? Can the government make an informed decision to make a better decision than the market is failing to, right? Can it decide the amount of fireworks to have? Can it decide the amount of police to hire? How is it making that decision? What criteria is it using? And of course, this is an interesting thought. What if market failure like, for instance, horse manure in Manhattan that had tons of externalities when we had the horse carriages. And, of course, livestock, it was pretty hard in the old west to kind of keep your livestock from getting kidnapped, right? These could be considered market failures, and then government intervention could come in. But these two things were actually solved by market innovations, right? The advent of cars and barbed wire. So maybe we don't need government intervention. Maybe market failure is just a way of the market telling us, hey, there's a need here, there's some good that needs to be served, so maybe we need a market intervention. And last but not least, we have the incentives to government. We hear a lot about lobbying. What if government is using its powers to externality, to fix externalities in public goods, so that it kind of uses this for its friends, you know, maybe it gives certain companies favor over others. So again, we have to be careful to give government more power because the incentives may not be aligned with what the public wants. 
Okay, everyone, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments, and I will see you later.